we will turn in our scriptures to Luke chapter 18 today. Going back to Luke 18. It's a great mass exodus of children. Amen. So we're back into the word uh, this morning on Luke chapter 18. That's been a, a portion of scripture that we have been hanging out in our most recent study, our most recent ministry of the word, and that is prayer it is a conversation with God. And we've been talking a lot about praying. I just want to let you know that the uh, prayer journals did come in last week, and we will be giving those out as uh We'll probably start giving them out next week on the 17th. And I'm asking you that when you do receive them, don't start using them until January 1st because that's when we're going to start. And I'll be sharing on the uh, um, on New Year's Eve day, that Sunday, uh, what our, our hope is by using those journals for the first 40 days of the year. We've been talking a lot about prayer. I, I shared the last time that we spoke in the installment on prayer. I shared about praying in the courts of heaven, how to pray in the courts of mercy, uh, and how to go before the Lord, how to offer yourself uh, through the blood of Christ, how to come into a legal realm of prayer, how to present your case before the Lord as this woman, as uh, actually this widow, uh, speaks to us through the parable that Jesus gives us in chapter uh, 18 verses 1 through 8. We also know that the widow, that Jesus uses a widow because the widow was the least of the least among the people in, G in Jesus' time. We also know that the widow represents someone that would have never been able to go to court on her own. And Jesus says, if the widow got justice, how much more will we, God's elect, get justice? And it's a beautiful depiction that the widow tells us that even the least among us can present our cases before the courts of heaven and will be heard. And so it's a beautiful love uh, story and love relationship that the Lord is trying to show us here. So we, we read here in uh, chapter 18, verse 1, And he, Jesus, told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. And that's a hard part about prayer, isn't it? Not losing heart. Not getting discouraged. Yeah. Right? And we're going to come back to that in just a moment. Reading further, verse 2, he said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps be bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? I spent some time last time going through um, Old Testament scriptures as well. I could, I could spend literally two or three weeks just showing you from the Bible where conversation after conversation that God has with his people is in a courtroom setting. Where he is bringing an indictment against Israel or an indictment against people, against the enemies. And that when we pray, Jesus, and I can show this to you through Jesus' model of prayer several times, where we are called to come into the courts of heaven and present our case because the adversary is always against us. He is always speaking ill against us. Revelation 12 says, day and night, he stands before the throne of grace and the throne of mercy, God's throne, and he's accusing the brethren. And so there are times that your thoughts and the accusations that you're going through in your life, in your own thought life, are coming from the enemy, and they actually may have some validity to them. You need to know how to go into the courts of heaven and dispel those and be for the right court and go to the court of mercy and be able to state your case. And we have handouts in the back on how to do that, and many people have already begun to do that. 
So we come back to our text this morning, and one of the things that we read is, to, there's two things I want to uh, point us to. First, in verse 1, we ought always to pray and not lose heart, which is the hardest part. I really believe that of prayer. Not losing heart. How many of you have prayed for something for a while, and it's no answer yet? Right? I mean, it's not like God is Ver, uh, Verizon or whoever. Can you hear me now? I mean, he, he, he hears us, right? And, and, you know, we're, we're such an impatient people that when we use these today and we text somebody and we don't get a, an immediate response in the next three seconds, I didn't even say 30, we're going, are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Hello? What are you mad at me? What did I do now? Huh? Right? And all the while, their phone died. Yeah. Or all the while something else happened. They're driving and they don't want to be unsafe. But you just keep blowing it up. First of all, that says how incredibly needy you are. So grow up. Okay? I mean, come on. You know, she still loves you. You've been married 28 years. That's in my case. She still loves me. Don't have to keep going. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Miha, Miha, are you there? No. She's there. All right? I want to talk about this word speedily again. It is important for us to revisit this issue or this word that Jesus says, how much more will the Father speedily give you justice? Now, we also talked last time, when somebody says, I'll be there in a while, what's a while? Right? Do you have a while on your watch? What hour is that? What, what's a while on your calendar? Right? What's a while? It could be a minute. It could be a thousand years. Again, remember in God's kingdom, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. And how many times do you feel like you've been living a thousand years in one day? Just waiting. Come on, God. When are you going to give me some help here? Speedily is a result. And I want you to get this. Matter of fact, you need to lean in for this. Come on, lean. Because if you're not leaning, I'm not talking. Speedily is in connection with being persistent. Okay? This is what Jesus is talking about. Remember, Jesus is teaching us how to be persistent in prayer, but more, more so, how to be persistent with a legal and a judicial prayer life that allows God to give us judgments according to His justice system. Speedily may not be in the time frame that we... When I say speedily, what does that mean to you? All right. All right. Have you ever gone to speedy oil change? That's what they say. I go there. And I'll tell you, it is 20 minutes or less as long as there's no line. If you're the only one there, it's 20 minutes or less. Right? But if there's a line, it's 20 minutes or less for each one. So if you've got four people, you've got 80 minutes. Right? How many, think, how many of you think God's got a lot of people that are praying to him? Does anybody, or is it just you think you're the only one that prays? Oh, he's only listening to me. Right? You know, imagine if God only gave us days that he heard us. All right, I will hear you on the third Thursday of every odd year of every odd month. Oh, great. Right? No, he hears us all the time. Right? It's important for us, I believe, in this area of understanding speedily, because I believe where the adversary hits us most in our prayer life isn't so much what to say, it's how long it takes God to answer us where we get frustrated. It's where we are anticipating God to do something always now. Why? Because some preachers will say that the way that Jesus taught us to pray is that whatever you pray will be done immediately, right then and there, and if it's not, it's a lack of faith or you're sinning. And I would say that's bunk. And I would say that you cannot prove that scripturally anywhere. That is just somebody who wants to make you feel like they're building up your faith. And no, a lot of people get discouraged when they hear somebody say that. Well, maybe I don't have enough faith, although I'm believing. Or maybe I do have sin in my life. Can I share something with you? We all do. <laughs> You say, oh no, I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. So am I, but I still have sin. You say, no you don't. Well, okay, then don't read Romans chapter 7, what Paul said, because that dude was filled with the Holy Spirit, so much so that he wrote two-thirds of the Bible. 
And yet he said, I struggle with sin all the time. Oh, wretched man that I am. Now, let me tell you, when he wrote that, he was, this was after he got saved. He's much after. Because, you know, when he first got saved, he says, I am Paul. I am the chiefest of the apostles. I'm here now. Now we can really minister the gospel. And by the time the Lord got done with him, and he's in a Roman prison, he's saying, I am Paul, the chiefest of sinners. And I am Paul, oh wretched man that I am, am writing to you. Oh, by the way, if you read the book of Romans, it's a judicial book. He's writing out how the law works. The law of grace. The law of love. It's a judicial book. So what interrupts persistent prayer? I believe it's this issue of waiting. It's timing. People get impatient. Listen to what the Lord spoke to us earlier in our service. He says, it's not by your might, nor by your power, but by my, by my spirit, says the Lord. You see, this thing of timing, this issue of timing, is where all of us, including me, get very impatient. And what do we want to do after we've prayed? And a lot of times we pray last, but even when we're praying first, what do we do? We get impatient and we want to do what? Take it over. Oh, I'll fix this. <laughs> and then you'll put God in it. Oh, I just think the Lord's telling me to fix it. Yeah, no, 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 he's not. Be careful. Okay? You see, the, adv the adversary will always use the time factor to get us discouraged. Oh, you've been praying for your healing for 15 years. Really? You think God's going to do that? Well, I, I know I got a word. He said he was going to heal me. He told me he was going to heal me. Well, yeah, he's going to kill you off. That's how he's going to heal you. Right? I mean, the adversary all acts like Puerto Rican, like, right? Oh, he's going to get you. He don't like you. Right? Now what do you do? Or he goes to Detroit. Yeah, you think you all that? God ain't going to heal you. He's going to offer you. And then, and then all your whole family's going to say you were healed and went to heaven. How's that for healing? Right? Come on. Somebody's got to tell me they've heard that. Mm, maybe not in the Detroit version, but... But here's what Jesus is doing by telling us that he's saying, listen to the widow, what, the, what, the, what this unjust judge did for the widow. A widow who was the least of the least of the least in society. Matter of fact, I said it before, I'll say it again. In Jesus' time, not only did the Pharisees misuse the, the, the widows, but everybody did. And everybody who knew a widow thought they were cursed. And that's why their husbands had died. So Jesus says, listen to this. If this unjust judge, this person who does not fear God and gives no regard to man, including widows, answers this widow and gives her justice, he says, how much more will your heavenly father give you, his elect, his people, his child, how much more will he give you justice? Come on, this is faith stuff, folks. He's given us a, a reassurance, and better yet, a confidence that our Father is a just judge, holy and righteous, and if an unjust judge knows how to give a widow lady her due justice, how much more will God, when you go into the courts of heaven and he hears your case, give you justice if you're persistent? That's a loving God. He's showing us that he, much more, and he goes on to say later, if your son asks for an egg, are you going to give him a rock? Are you going to give him a scorpion if he asks for something to eat? No, he says, how much more does the father want to bless you? You have a father that wants to bless you. Turn to somebody and say, your father wants to bless you. And we're not talking about the earthly father. We're talking about the heavenly father. You see, speedily lets us know something about the Father. That the Father is willing and wanting to answer us and give us our request. And I would say to you that the Lord giving us our request is more to do about His love and His grace in our life than it does about what we're praying for. You may ask, well, why then does He take so long? Has anybody ever asked that? Come on. In the Bible, they say, how long, O oh Lord? Even in the book of Revelation, how long, O oh God, are you going to allow this? 
Jesus even said in the end times that he's going to cut the end times short for the elect's sake. You know why? Because even the elect could be deceived. You say, well, why then does God's own elect, why does his people often wait while suffering for an answer? Why do they wait for an answer while they're suffering? Have you ever asked God why? God, when? How long? God, I've been praying. God, I've been praying for two and a half days about this major issue. You should have answered me speedily. God, I prayed three minutes ago. Where's the answer? You said. Well, let's look at James chapter 5. This will give us an answer. Look at James chapter 5. This gives us a beautiful, deep rooted answer to why maybe God will allow us to wait. Why he may allow us to suffer a little more. I was talking to somebody recently and they said, you know, it's funny because you've always talked about you preach a liberating gospel. You preach a gospel, Eric, that, that, that liberates and talks about the grace of God, but you also talk about a suffering gospel. I don't think you can preach the whole gospel without talking about the suffering gospel. I don't think you can. I, I, as a matter of fact, you read First and Second Peter, he's talking to suffering people. He's talking to the dispersed of Israel, the Jewish believers all around the world who are dispersed, telling them, I know you're in exile. I know some of you are, are on the run. You got, re, you, you got those wanted posters out after you. I know that you're, you're living poor lives in the natural, but you're rich spiritually. And I want you to know that this day will end. This season in your life will end one day. It may be now, it may be tomorrow, and it may be when the Lord returns. But keep the faith and know who you are in the Lord. A suffering gospel. It's not about all suffering, but there are times. Look at verse 7 in chapter 5 of the writing of James, which is the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, be patient. Well, we don't want to hear that. Come on. I want patience now. Be patient. Therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. That's like the third time he's telling me to be patient. I just want to get, get, get going, right? Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the, time, in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You see what I just said? I said, man, you might be going through something, but stay steadfast. And then we finish up. It says, you have heard of the steadfastness of Job. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Now, would you have believed that about Job's story when you first started reading it? No. And remember, if you look at the book of Job, it's a judicial matter. It's an indictment. God is being indicted by Job and his friends. And Job is being indicted by his friends. And then God comes into the courts and finally, in the last chapters, tears Job up in front of the bench, right? And says, who are you, you little worm? Were you there when I put everything in place? When I placed the stars in place? When I put the blades of grass in place? When I put the Leviathan in the ocean? Were you there? Tell me, when did I get counsel from you, old Job? And if you read the language, it's all in a courtroom setting. And he mentions Job here. He says, remember Job. The steadfastness of Job and what it produced. You see, this is a reminder of justice. The righteous are waiting for the Lord to right what is wrong. And didn't the Bible say that in the end times, right would be wrong and wrong would be right? And aren't we there? Oh, yeah. Aren't we already living it? 
<laughs> I love my brother. He's he's uh, studying for the ministry. He's actually operating in the ministry right now. And he's a great, great man. And I love him because uh, we were talking about three or four weeks ago, and we were talking about the end times. And he said, he goes, man, brother. He said, if we're not living in the end times, I don't want to, because <laughs> it sure feels like it. Am I right? It feels like we're there, man. Right's wrong, wrong's right. You know, Christianity is just an old religion for, you know, the elderly and for weak people and some children. You know, those who believe are just, you know, they're, they're, they're somewhere else, right? And so these people are waiting for the, what's right to be, what's wrong to be right. And so many of us, aren't we waiting for that in our lives? You see, our Father is waiting, and here's what James speaks to us. Our Father is waiting for the time of precious fruit to develop. That is a direct result of waiting patiently. You see, fruit can only come, vegetation can only come, and it only mature when you've waited the amount, the allotted amount of time for it to come. Yeah, we have greenhouses and all these hybrids now and all these things that you shoot it into it and boom, like that, right? It's like, wow, when did that tomato get like this, right? And, and isn't it funny? You get you get two sets of apples. You get a you get you get the Granny Smith apple, and then you get the Granny Smith organic apple. And you look at them both, and at first you see that there's probably not a whole lot of difference. They're both waxed up and looking nice and shiny. But there's a difference in what this apple was given to make it come into fruition versus the long-awaited time that it took for the organic to grow. And isn't it just like Christians? We want the fast growth with little, with, with little results. We want everything now. You know what the mustard seed's good for? You say, yeah, mustard. No. First of all, it's the smallest of all seeds. And when a mustard seed or a mustard plant grows, it has one of the biggest leaves of all the plants. Here's the problem, though. It grows so fast and so quick, it looks like it's productive. But all it is is a big leaf, and it doesn't have much fruit to it yet. And what did Jesus say happens to that mustard plant? The birds come. They represent the spirits of darkness and all the other spirits around us. And they put their nest in there. What do they do? They end up eating it away. Why? Because it grew so quick, but it had no substance. It had no root to it. It has nothing more than just a big leaf. And a lot of Christians were walking around with big leaf Christianity, but have no root. They have no fruit there. You lift up that, there's nothing there. Nothing there. Fig tree, the biggest leaf. What did Jesus do when he saw that fig tree? He saw big leaves on it. And what did that represent? There's got to be some fruit. Hey, guess what? Guess what Adam and Eve covered themselves with? What? I'm going to tell you. Okay, right, I'm going to break this down. Two things you got to hear about the fig leaf. First of all, once it picks, picked off, and once you separate it from the tree, it begins to shrink. So they covered themselves with the biggest thing they could find, and pretty soon it went whoosh, and shrunk up. They couldn't even cover their own nakedness. <laughs> so Jesus sees a fig tree. You know what he does? I'm stepping down. So you know what he does? He goes to the fig tree, and what is he expecting to find? Figs. Fig Newtons. And he lifts up the leaf, and what does he find? Nothing. So he curses it. But do you think he cursed it because he was so hungry he didn't get a fig? You know what he was doing? Oh, you got to get this. He was cursing man's way of covering their own sin. And becoming the covering for their sin. You can't make this up. I'm going to say that again. When he cursed the fig tree, he was reminded of what Adam and Eve did to cover their sin and said, that won't work anymore. And what you do to cover your own sin won't work anymore. I'm here to cover it for you. And just a little while, when my blood drips, it'll take care of it all for you. Hmm? Come on, I'll let that sit for a second. Let that maturate. Let that, let that grow in you a little bit. Let that be a patient word. 
Turn to somebody and say, stop doing it on your own. Stop it. He wasn't cursing it because he was so stinking hungry. Jesus could have went like that and had figs on it. He was cursing what man used to cover their own sin so that they would no longer use it and that they would rely on him. You see, as a good husbandman, the father waits for the proper time, and this is the tough part, the proper time of maturity to give us the answer. It's when we can handle it. Oh, that hurts. So you say, well, what does that say? It's going to hurt. But I warned you. Sometimes what he is saying is you have to be a little bit more mature in order for me to give you what you've just asked for. I have to know that you can be trusted with it and that you have the right root system and that you have the right vegetation and the right maturity of fruit in your life that when I give you this, that you can handle it. Oh, come on. This is good. This is good preaching. This is really good preaching. You see, like the precious fruit... We too are growing and maturing at gradual levels. And I want to say this, and this, this is probably going to cause some controversy, especially if somebody watches this, but oh well, um, you, can, you can email me. Most Christians don't like gradual level growth. They want it now, and they think if they don't get it now, their faith somehow, or they've been told, or they, they're not getting into the promises. And No, 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 listen to me. Listen to your pastor in this. Listen to me. I'm telling you from the Word of God that the best way to grow as a Christian is to go down into the soil, like Jesus said in John chapter 12, and be like that husk of, of that little grain seed and die to self, and then in the right time begin to germinate and begin to grow organically and naturally or spiritually in our case, but in a way that only the Lord can do it. So that the growth is gradual and not so quick that you become so filled with yourself. Because the scripture says that a novice, a new Christian, shouldn't be in leadership in a church because they will get so filled with themselves that they'll get so puffed up, they'll lead the people astray. So we want mature people preaching. We want mature people teaching us. We want mature worship leaders like we had this morning. We want mature people. Not that they're more mature than everybody else in the world, but that they're maturing in their faith. They're growing. They've gone through some stuff. They've waited on the Lord patiently for some stuff. They're still waiting on the Lord patiently for some stuff. And God's continually, as a good husbandman, doing what He needs to do to grow and mature you so that when He answers your prayer, when He comes and gives you what you have requested of Him, that is His will for your life in Jesus' name, you can receive it and you won't take any of it for yourself but you'll give Him all the glory. It's only through gradual development and growth that we reach our divine destiny. Our Father is the only one who can determine the right time and the right season to give us that ripened, speedily answer. While we wait for the speedily answer, our Father is lovingly doing something in us. He's cultivating deeper faith, deeper patience, deeper trust levels in Him. And he's teaching us something that many don't want to hear about. He's teaching us how to wait. How to wait. How to wait. To be still and what? Know that I am God. Then break it down even further. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. still and know that I am God, break it all the way back to the B. B. Just be. Just be there. Just wait. Just wait. And I hear in the spirit realm where the Lord in some cases have said to me, your waiting's over. I've heard where he said, wait a little more. I'm hearing this for people in our church. Some of you, you're waiting time in certain situations. The answer's coming speedily. Some of you, the same people I'm talking to, there's some other issues that the Lord's saying, just wait a little longer. I'm still working. 
I'm still doing, I'm still ripening, I'm still growing you. You know what Isaiah 30, 18 says about the Lord? It says that the Lord waits, get this, the Lord waits to be gracious to you. That's what it says. He waits to be gracious to you. Here's what Charles Spurgeon says about delayed answers. I love this. I came, the Lord gave this to me this week. I was like, wow. I'm going to quote Charles Spurgeon now. It says, our father has personal reasons for keeping us waiting. Sometimes it is to show his power and his sovereignty so that we may learn that God has a right to give or to withhold. Wow. I keep going. More often, the delay is for our benefit. You are perhaps kept waiting in order that your desires may be more fervent. God knows that delay will quicken and increase desire. And that if he keeps you waiting, you will see your need more clearly and will seek more diligently and that you're, you will treasure the mercy all the more on account of the waiting. That's pretty deep. Charles Spurgeon. I love that, what he said. I got to go back to that one point. It says, sometimes it is to show his power and his sovereignty so that we may learn that God has the right to give and he has the right to withhold. And I think someone in the Bible said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. I'm just thinking about a little man named Job. Not Steve Jobs. Job, I mean. I'm sorry. When the seas of maturity reaches its fullness, guess what will happen? Speedily will happen. When you've gotten to the point where you persevered and you're waiting on God and you keep presenting your case before Him and the waiting is over and He's done His work in you in that area of your life, then the speedily will happen. We must do our part to avoid from, de from allowing the delay of God to shake our faith. I think of the pastor that I got saved under. He's 93 or 94 years old, still alive today. He told me when I was a youngster, he told me that, that he believed the Lord told him that he would see the second coming of the Lord here on the earth, that he would be a part of it. Man, I hope he's right. So far, I'm pulling for him. He's doing all right. Right? But think about this. When he told that to me, do you know how many years ago that was? 35. Do you think 35 years ago when he was getting ready to come to the end of his full-time ministry and start to retire, he probably thought, all right, it's going to happen, it's going to happen, maybe the next 10, 20 years or so? 35 years ago he told me that. Still waiting. Your time of speedily may come. It might be around the corner. It might be right now. It might be that that area the Lord's been working on in you. It might be a patience level. It might be a faith level. It might be learning to trust Him more. I love how Rich opened up with trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. You see, don't allow, if the Lord is tilling in your life right now, to bring forth a better fruitful situation in your life. Don't let that waver your faith. If he's tilling you right now, or if he is, maybe right now he's watering you. Maybe you've already begun to bud. Maybe you've already begun to become a bigger shoot. And all of a sudden you're starting to show some health. And you're starting to show some vegetation. and starting to show some maturity. Don't, don't get overwhelmed by the waiting. Let that waiting take it, as James said, be patient. Be patient. Be patient. Because in due season, when he's ready, then there's going to be a speedily moment in your life. And just like he did with Elisha when the mantle of Elijah came on him immediately while he was plowing, and your moment, you might be plowing, you might be at work, and all of a sudden, boom, speedily, your answer is there. The phone call comes, the bank account increases, the job is there, the healing is there. But in that moment, it will be because God says you're ready to be able to handle it. Man, this is good preaching. Don't allow the watering. If you're, if you're being watered and being nurtured right now, don't allow that to discourage you. Keep praying, keep persevering in prayer, and persevere until you have been told otherwise. Until you've been told otherwise. Would one of both of you come?
please and play sometimes we have to be reminded that as much as the Lord loves us he's not a sugar daddy he's not a sugar daddy and he said only the things that we truly ask that are of the Father's will are what we can be guaranteed to get so it's important to know that but he's no sugar daddy and I'm going to say something that a lot of people aren't going to like to hear but God don't owe you nothing <laughs> he don't owe you nothing my friend you owe him everything and, 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 and we should be thankful that we are even given the privilege to approach the highest court in the universe that we have been given the privilege through the blood of Christ. That's why I always say when people give testimonies and when they got saved, they say, don't ever say that you found God. You didn't find Him. He found you. And be thankful He found you. Just be thankful that you were given the opportunity to respond to Him finding you. You say, well, Pastor, I'm, I'm, a, I'm seated with Christ. You've told me that. You told me that I, 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 you know, I, I, am, I, I am blessed and highly favored. You are. But at the end of the day, we were still all birthed out of dirt. We sometimes got to bring it back to reality, folks, who we are and who he is. But always remember he's a father who loves us. Always remember that he's looking at your life to see what's going to bring the maximum glory to him and not you. And he's waiting for you. And I'm going to say this because somebody needs to hear this right now. Somebody needs to hear that he's been waiting for you to yield. To yield yourself to the growing process. To yield yourself to the maturing. He might be putting some miracle grow on you right now. He might be putting some other stuff on you right now to get you to be ready for the growth in a season that's coming. But he's been waiting for you to yield to it. Because Jesus said, look at the lilies of the field and how they yield themselves to the Lord and he clothes them. Listen, our God doesn't trample down his garden. He lifts it up. He nurtures it. And he'll love it. And he'll speak to it. And he'll do all that he has to do, even include remove things. But he'll add what he needs to add. He'll water when he needs to water. He'll do all of that. But he's just waiting for you to say, I yield in this place for you to continue to mature and make me as ripened and as fruitful so that as I pray, you can now answer my prayer. And I, by the way, God, I give you the right to say no. Oh. I give you the right to say no. I'm going to close with this. I don't have it, but I'm going to use this paper to do it. Oh, it is. Perfect. Thank you, Lord. That, this is, wow. Do you see anything here besides a white piece of paper? I'm not doing a magic trick. Do you see anything here? Most people, when they come into their prayer room, this is full. With God, do this. Be careful the flame, right? Can I say this? I want to encourage you, and I'm going to be encouraging you as you enter the new year. I'm going to encourage you, Troy, and I'm going to encourage you, Rebecca, as well, and anybody who's watching. Come to God this new year with a blank piece of paper and say, God, you fill it. You fill it. You do what you want to do. And I'll write it down as you do it. How about that? Wouldn't that be a nice prayer list? God, what's your prayer list? I give you a blank sheet. Write what you want for me, and I'll pray that way. Mm. Well, here's the altar call this morning. Here's the response. It's not even an altar call. Here's where you get to respond. You say, Lord, the Lord wants one thing from us this morning. Only one thing. He wants people who are willing to yield. Who are just willing to yield right where they're at. Will you stand if you're willing to yield to the Lord? I'm willing to yield. 
I'm willing to yield to the process no matter how long, how patient I need to be. Give me the patience that I'm going to need because I know I'm going to need it. I am willing to yield so that I can yield a harvest for you. So that I can be ready for when you want to answer me in this. When you want to give me justice. When you want to hear me and give me speedily answers. I want to be fruitful enough and mature in that fruit. To know that I am only a recipient of what brings you glory. So today, Father, we yield. And we give you the permission. Yes. Ooh, this is hard. Yes. To say no. Yes. I give you permission. And I ask you to continue your work in me so that what you have for me, the destiny and the plans and the purposes that are yet to be fulfilled, that I will be maturely ready for those. That I won't get it before I'm mature enough to handle it. That's right. That I won't get it before... I'm ripened enough and seasoned enough to be able to know that it, it's from you and it's your glory. So today, Lord, I ask you, help me to not lose heart. Help me to not grow weary in doing well. Help me to not give up because of the delay. I ask you today to infuse all of us, Lord, with a greater hope and a greater joy of waiting on you. So that when we pray and we have our conversations with you, God, that they are coming from a father and son relationship that's ever maturing and growing. Father and daughter relationship that's ever maturing and growing. And that we are willing to say to you, not my will, but thine be done. And for this, we will give you the praise and we'll give you the glory. And everybody together says, Amen.